Imagine for a second that you're on Mars and, and you've just been infected by a bacteria that stowed, stowed away on your spacecraft. And unfortunately, uh, there's not really a, a, you don't have an entire library of every drug on Earth. And while it would be easy to treat this microbe on Earth, uh, you simply don't have the drug. Is that, should we decide then that um, the mission is over? Or should we do something about it? Now, if we're lucky, perhaps synthetic biology as a field will have evolved to the point where we might be able to produce the drug that you need right there on Mars. This may not be possible, but given what we know now, it seems potentially feasible to do in the future. So synthetic biology, you might envision that you could engineer an organism. Uh, B. subtilis might be one example. It's uh, already used for industrial production. It's been genetically engineered to produce many different enzymes and other products. So you might imagine taking an organism like that engineering it to produce um, maybe a simple drug. And uh, since B. subtilis is a, is a normal commensal uh, for humans, then you can envision once that production has been accomplished, you might simply be able to drink the product of that. So I'm not saying that will happen, but it's not outside the realm of possibility. And because it can also go into a spore state, you might envision maybe uh, a card or some other collection of you know, different spores of these engineered organisms. And when you wanted to make something in particular, it could be a drug, but it could also be, uh, you, know, you could imagine that uh, synthetic biology could also play a role in your life support system or maybe in combination with uh, food growth or you know, some other crop production or some other characteristic that you might, some, some feature that you might want to have as part of your Mars mission. You might just take that card and, and take the particular organism that you need and grow it and get your drug and then take it and um, cure yourself from this infection. Of course, many, many drugs might be too complicated to produce this way. They might not be formulated in the right way. There are many hurdles to doing this, but that's not outside the realm of possibility. And that's one way in which synthetic biology might be applied in the future to uh, space exploration, but it could also be applied to non-human missions. In the context of a robotic mission, you might envision uh, a synthetically engineered organism acting as a reporter. It might detect, for example, very low levels of particular uh, nutrients or chemicals, and then uh, it could glow green, for example, producing GFP in response to detecting a particular chemical, or it could produce uh, something that could be read out in other ways. So these are some of the ways in which uh, synthetic biology might be applied to future space missions. Now, there's a big problem with synthetic biology systems in that right now, uh, we're really at the infancy of the field. Uh, it's becoming easier to do the engineering of a genome, but uh, we also need ways to analyze these systems. And you might be able to build in a reporter like fluorescence, for example, or some other reporter. But you might also want to monitor at a more fundamental level in that uh, you might want to know if the, the genetics are stable. And so we're building an instrument to go search for life on Mars based on the idea that life on Mars, if it in fact exists, could be related to life on Earth. So we're building a small RNA and DNA sequencer. And the idea there is uh, if we had a, a device like that, say with human explorers or on a robotic mission, it could be used to monitor a synthetic biology system. And even more fundamental than that, a precursor for having biology in space and expecting it to be functional it is to show that an, at an organism level, but also at the component level, that biological components might survive some of the rigors of spaceflight. And this is being empirically tested in, in different ways. Uh, B. subtilis, for example, has been flown uh, in the space environment, uh, directly exposed to the vacuum of low Earth orbit. Um, a number of studies were published on this in, in 2013. Uh, but 
Uh, also, we need to understand at the component level, can we use biological components in space instruments? And can we use them as part of future you know, synthetic biology components of space missions? And so this is also a critical aspect of validating uh, our life detection instrument from Mars. We're using biological components. We're using DNA polymerase. And we're using other enzymes. We're using DNA itself as a positive control. Or we're using oligo, DNA oligos as primers. Uh, during a sequencing reaction or during PCR. And so one of the things that we did was to take a number of these different components and expose them to analogs of space radiation. And we did this with, we exposed them to neutrons uh, at the MIT nuclear reactor. In particular, we didn't use the reactor itself. We used a californium source and to provide uh, uh, neutron exposure uh, that would be commensurate with um, a mission to Mars. Uh, neutrons not being one of the primary components of radiation, but is a very common secondary. And then we also used uh, components of space radiation like uh, protons, which you can get both from solar radiation as well as galactic cosmic radiation. And so we, we uh, exposed our reagents to protons. We also exposed them to, uh, and that was here at Mass General in the proton facility. And then we also exposed our reagents to uh, heavy ions like iron and oxygen uh, down at Brookhaven National Lab. That's one of, the, uh, one of the few places, if not the only place on Earth, where you can, do, uh, you can simulate this heavy ion component of galactic cosmic radiation. And so, so far, at Mars relative doses, we found very, very few effects. At much higher doses that you might encounter, say, uh, at Europa, uh, we did see some impacts. So there we've only tested protons, but we did see some impacts. And so we would expect that, you know, if you want to do uh, life detection at Europa, you're either going to, and you're bringing biological components, you're going to really need to uh, do some shielding. We see this uh, validation of biological components as a fundamental uh, introduction to the potential use of synthetic biology in space. And we hope that as the field develops, we will see some uh, serious applications of synthetic biology uh, in space. When we think about biology in space, there are a number of challenges we have to address. Um, first and foremost that might come to our minds is space radiation. And the second one might be uh, storage. So typically in the lab, uh, there's a lot of care and feeding of biological systems, whether it's a C. elegans worm or whether it's a cell culture. We're always propagating them and uh, keeping them protected. And of course, we would have to do the same thing in the space environment. And that imposes a really heavy burden on the system, the spacecraft that's supporting that biology. Of course, it makes human space exploration you know, very expensive from a mass perspective, from a dollar perspective, but also from a technical perspective. And so with future synthetic biology applications, we'll have to deal with that. Now, how do we do that? One way to do it is to take advantage of organisms that have evolved very robust mechanisms of stasis. For example, organisms that go into a spore state or go into some other state of minimal nutrient usage where they're typically um, very, they can tolerate um, huge temperature ranges or concentrations. One example there might be water bears, tardigrades, which uh, are eukaryotes but have been shown to tolerate a tremendous range of temperatures from near absolute zero to extreme heat. And so you can envision using some of the genetics of these organisms to create uh, synthetic or genetically engineered systems that are uh, that can be in stasis for a long period of time and can be woken up when their application is required. So synthetic biology as a whole is still really at the beginning of its evolution. In a way, it's incremental because the work that's already been done on genetic engineering, synthetic biology is kind of a natural next step, maybe a more extreme version of that. At the same time, we can envision many applications of synthetic biology for space but it's going to take a tremendous amount 
of development to see if we can actually apply synthetic biology in a meaningful way to space. If we're able to store synthetic biology systems uh, so that they're stable across a range of temperature ranges, don't require nutrient inputs for a long period of time, et cetera, to make them compatible with space applications, well then we will be able to harness the tremendous potential within these tiny little computers uh, called cells. And we'll be able to harness them to do parallel detection of uh, many chemical or other species in the environment, to provide signals, uh, to, to basically replace very complicated systems with very tiny and powerful biological-based systems. <music>